Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 14 of LTech 676. Quiet. Thank you for your patience, as I'm a bit behind with releasing this week's materials. The good news is I don't think this delay will impact you much at all as we head into the final weeks of the semester. Okay, I want to begin this week's video by taking a look at the calendar. We're coming up on the end of the semester, so I want to take a few minutes to make sure we're all on the same page about what's left in the course. Now, this video represents session 14, which, although coming to you late, runs from Tuesday through Monday. Then, of course, we'll have session 15, and then we'll have our final session, session 16. In other words, we have three weeks left in the semester. Now, today, I'm assigning the final paper, and that final paper is going to be due at 11.55 a.m. on Monday, May 8th. So that gives you roughly three weeks from today to work on this last assignment. So let's talk about that final paper. The final paper asks you to write a brief synthesis of the main ideas of LTech 676. Keep in mind that the word synthesis means to combine a number of things into a coherent whole. So that's your goal with this paper. It's to combine what we've covered all semester into a coherent whole. Now, that's going to take some thought and planning. What I don't want you to do with this paper is simply to make a list of all of the things we talked about this semester. That wouldn't be helpful, and it wouldn't be a synthesis. Instead, I want you to level up your analysis of the class. One way to think about doing this is to pretend you are writing a summary of the main ideas of LTech 676 for someone who wasn't able to take the class. How would you synthesize the class for that person? What would you want them to know about? With that in mind, what are the parameters of the paper? Well, the length of the paper is deliberately short. Your paper should be between five and six pages. These are double-spaced pages, and that page length excludes references. Your final paper should also include your three concept maps in an appendix. And like the references, the pages of the appendix do not count against your overall page limit. In terms of style, your writing should be formal and academic in nature. It should follow APA 7, and importantly, your paper should draw explicitly on the course readings. In case it is helpful, I want to show you a sample outline of how you might write this paper. This is just one approach, so you don't have to follow this outline. That said, it might be helpful in thinking about how to approach the assignment. For the first page, I would focus on an introduction. I would explain what I'm going to talk about and why. On the second page, I'd introduce my first big idea, whatever I think that is. I'd explain what the big idea is, and I'd provide some examples of that idea as it relates to education and technology. From there, I'd tell the reader about why this big idea is important in terms of social and ethical issues. On the third page, I would introduce another big idea, and I'd follow the same pattern. What is the big idea? What are some concrete examples of that idea? And why is that idea important? I would then follow this same pattern again for the third big idea on page four. And then on page five, I'd write a conclusion to the paper. And in the conclusion, I'd briefly recap what I talked about, and then I'd discuss what it all means in relation to what an educator should know about educational technology. Finally, in my paper, I would use page six to list all of the references that I cited, and I would use the seventh page as an appendix where I'd include copies of my concept maps, one per page. So that's how I tackle this assignment, and I hope it is helpful. Again, this is just a sample outline to give you an idea of what the final paper could look like. In terms of grading, the final paper will be graded in seven areas. Its purpose, content, organization, layout and design, writing mechanics, use and quality of references, and citations. Please see the final paper rubric in Canvas for more details about each of these areas. To keep it simple, your grades on the final paper will be based on 100 points. However, the actual weight of your paper is the equivalent of two concept maps. 
Just reach out to me if you have any questions about this or any other aspect of the final paper. Okay, that's enough talk about the calendar and the paper. Let's move on. Now, believe it or not, we have reached our final theme of the semester. So we've worked our way around, most recently talking about giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. And in the last couple of weeks, we are going to focus on gender and digital equity. Now, to get us started, I want to talk a little bit about historical perspectives on gender and education. And as usual, I'm keeping over here off to the right our dimensions of equity in education, fairness and inclusion. And I want to talk about these historical perspectives because I think it provides important context for the weeks ahead and are thinking about gender and digital equity. Now, importantly, we need to recognize that females have endured differing educational expectations and opportunities compared to their male counterparts. Now, I know for many of you in this class, this is a no-brainer. You have actually lived and experienced these differing expectations and opportunities. But for some folks, you may not be as familiar with some of these aspects of the history of education. So let's take a look at some ways in which education has been gendered over the years. So one example is, believe it or not, schools sometimes had different entrances for the sexes, as well as as separate playgrounds for boys and girls. In addition, schools often used sex differentiated curriculum, such as focusing on needlework, cookery, and laundry for females, as opposed to reading, writing, and arithmetic. In addition, girls were expected to fulfill the roles of quote-unquote good wives and little mothers, which resulted in erratic school attendance. Middle-class girls were largely educated for the marriage market. They were prepared to be makers of homes, a role that superseded all others in and out of school. In addition, policies endorsed the view that women were different from men biologically, socially, intellectually, and psychologically. Furthermore, men often dominated the work of schools, government, and teacher unions. Finally, teachers often clustered student behavior into two categories, one for boys and another for girls, drawing on oppositional constructions of masculinity and femininity. Essentially, boys equaled livelier, adventurous, boisterous, independent, loyal, and aggressive behavior, whereas girls represented obedient, tidy, orderly, fussy, bitchy, and gossipy behaviors. So, so that's quite a list that really shed some light on the differing educational expectations and opportunities that females have endured relative to their male counterparts. Of course, in 1972 in the United States, we had Title IX, which was the federal law effectively barring sex discrimination in school sports and academics. And that has had a significant impact on some of the expectations and opportunities of women. And so in the weeks ahead, we're really going to focus on how that historical perspective and how 1972's Title IX has influenced gender and digital equity. We're going to examine how gender intersects with technology in general and educational technology in particular. Okay, everyone, that's all we have time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.